Hallelujah. So good to see you all today. I am so blessed and privileged to be here once again to share the word of life with us. If you remember from the beginning of this year, God has been doing amazing things in our lives. And um, all you need to do is to be, let your heart be open to receive what God wants to do in your life. I believe, like the word of God told us earlier in the year, eyes have not seen nor ears heard what this, the Lord wants to do for us because we are trusting in him. And for the fact that you're here present today means that you're trusting the Lord, means that you want to hear him speak to you. And I know he will speak to you in the language you will understand. About um, earlier on, I had ministered on the need for us to dwell in the word of God. To make the word of God the foundation of our lives. Because therein lies our victory. Because God wants to speak to us. And we hear him. We choose to hear him speak to us. We read about him in his word, read and know his heartbeat. We will study the word. We meditate and memorize the word. And one of the illustrations I gave on one of the occasions was like, when you talk about meditating on the word of God, putting in the word of God into your heart, into your system, it's like you take a foam sponge and put it in water. And when you lift it up, whatever you do with that foam that has been soaked with water, the thing that is going to come forth is water. And that's how it is in our lives. When we soak ourselves with the word of God, it will begin to comfort, the word of God in our lives begin to comfort in diverse areas. And my last ministration was on prayer. Because I said that the natural outflow of the word of God is that you begin to pray. You begin to make warfare with the word of God which you have received. And in that Colossians 3.16 that I was referring to, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, it says after that you'll be teaching yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart by the Holy Spirit. So you will discover because of the presence of the word of God in your life, the outflow will also be praise and worship. They go to hand in hand. The Bible tells us in um, Psalm 149 from verse 6, it says, Let the high praises of God be in your mouth, and the two-edged sword in your hand. With it you will execute vengeance upon the wicked, upon every challenging situation. The sword of the Spirit, we are told in Ephesians chapter 6, is the word of God. So the combination of the word of God and the high praises of God in our mouth will bring victory every time in our lives. It doesn't matter what we are passing through. If the word of God is there as the sword of the spirit and the high praises of God is in our mouth, we are sure to conquer. We become more than they that conquer because God inhabits the praises of his people. And when the almighty God's presence is in your midst, is in your situation, that situation can never remain the same again. And so today, you would have known we will be talking about somehow on praise and worship. That's one of the fundamental things that is going to see us through in our Christian life. It's very, very important. One thing we should know in Isaiah 43 verse 7, the Bible says we were created to worship God. We were created to praise the Lord. In fact, every creation, everything we see, they are just there to bring glory to God. And we are not um, exempted from it. The trees clap their hands. You see the birds of the air that sing for God. Every little thing that the Lord has created is made to worship God. And then, you know, usually people think, oh, what is the need for praise? Most times if we are asked a question, do you pray every day? We said yes. But if somebody will turn it around and ask you, do you praise God every day? You know, it's a different ballgame. But we are told 
that it is important that we praise God every day. The psalmist in Psalm 34 verse 1 says, At all times I will bless you, O Lord. Your praise will continually be in my mouth. The humble will hear of it. The afflicted will rejoice. There is no greater testimony in your life as a Christian than the praise of God coming forth, no matter what you're passing through. In fact, an aspect that we'll be talking about is the aspect we call sacrifice of praise. By the way, to praise means to bless, to glorify, to exalt, to thank, to magnify, to extol, to confess. And this we are referring to God. You know, when I talked on prayer, I mentioned about the Lord's Prayer in passing. One of those facets of uh, the, the uh, Lord's Prayer is when he says, Hallowed be your name. In other words, when you are coming to God, you come praising his name. You come exalting his name. You come magnifying his name. Let's say there is sickness in your body and you suddenly remember that one of the attributes of God is that he is the healer. He is Jehovah Rapha. You begin to praise him for who he is. You begin to praise him that he is a healer. Even if you were sick in your body, he will arise to that occasion and bring healing. If you have a need in your life, you remember him as the El Shaddai. You begin to praise him for his name. You begin to praise him for his attributes. As you're doing that, he will arise to that occasion. So that is why praise should be paramount in our lives as believers if we are going to be victorious, especially over the enemy. And by the way, you know, when you think of it, the only occupation we are going to have in heaven is to praise. There is nothing else we are going to do. You don't need to pray. The only thing we are going to do is that we are going to be like the angels. We will be worshiping God day and night. And I tell you, you have to start from here. Because if you don't start from here, when you get to heaven, you may be a misfit. Because you wouldn't know what to do. But we want to start from here to praise God. So that we, when we get there, we will offer him the highest perfect praise. Amen? Hallelujah. So you will see, even in the life of Jesus Christ... Praise characterized his whole life. Anytime he came across a great challenge, a great difficulty, the next thing he would do is to thank the Lord. Think about when he was confronted with feeding 5,000 men. Women were not counted. Children were not counted. The first thing he did was to lift the little he has up to God. And then as he thanks God, the food began to multiply. I don't know what you may be passing through in your situation that is making you think, what is there to thank the Lord? What I will be talking about today, like I said, is a sacrifice of praise. You will see also in the raising of Lazarus, when he came to the grave, what he did was just to thank God. Because as far as he knew, he knows that when you praise God, God manifests himself. Whatever thing that is a challenge, obstacle, begin, will begin to bow. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee bows. Every tongue confesses that he alone is the Lord. So, you know, in the recent time, Pastor Mike has been teaching us on the book of Leviticus. And last Wednesday, he, of course, even the other one, he took time to tell us about the pressing of the olive that brings the oil. The pressing. And... You know, when you talk about pressing, it's not that easy. It's something difficult. But that is the kind of thing we are talking about that we are going to offer to God a praise. Offering, that offering there signifies the sacrifice. And when he was talking to us, you remember he mentioned that that sacrifice that is being made which now, in those Old Testament, they used to bring all those animals and bulls and all that. Thanks be to God that Jesus has become the perfect sacrifice. So how do we fit into still doing the same sacrifice without bringing bulls and goats and all pigeons and everything? It is to offer the praise unto God. That is the sweet aroma he was talking about. That is the sweet incense that is being presented in heaven. There is something Revelations chapter 8 from verse 3 says. 
Sorry if I'm not opening my Bible, but you can check it up later. <laughs> In Revelation chapter 8, from verse 3, the Bible tells us that the incense, the angels in heaven bring the incense, um, the, the thing that is used to collect the incense, and then the prayers of the saints are also collected together, and then there is fire that is brought from the altar and put together with that incense, which is the worship we are offering. And the Bible says, as the angel gathers this thing and the fire is on it, he will cast it down to the earth and there will be earthquakes, thunderings, and all kinds of things. No wonder in Acts of the Apostles chapter 16, the Bible tells us of how Paul and Silas were thrown into the jail. And at midnight, the Bible tells us, at midnight, the time that it is the darkest, the time that it seems that nothing is happening again, I don't know at which point in your life you are right now. Are you at the time when you think that things have gone so bad and there is no way out? Are you in that midnight hour where nobody is with you and you're struggling? And it's like there is no hope again for tomorrow. The Bible said that Paul and Silas at midnight, they rose up, their hands and their feet were put in shackles. They were in serious bondage. They could not help themselves, but thank God their lips were left. As long as even their hands and their feet were shackled, but their lips, they could still have it. No wonder the Bible says, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And so, at midnight, the Bible said they prayed. Maybe like prayed. The next thing you hear is that they sang. Most times we might want to pray. It is good to pray. I talked about praying. But it is best to worship, to praise. When prayer seems not to be working, try praise. Praise never fails. So they praised. The next thing you saw was that there was earthquake. That thing that is happening in heaven because the sweet aroma, the incense has gone up to heaven and the angels have received it and they have put fire from the altar in heaven and put it and they cast it to the earth. Where there is a challenge, where there is a problem, and then what do you see next? Earthquakes, thunderings, the shackles on their body was all loose. The prison doors flung open. Even every other person that was bound there because of their own presence, everybody got loose. That's what the Lord can do in our praise. As our praise rise up to God, these things begin to happen in the spirit realm. You will get your deliverance, you will get your freedom. You will get what you're looking for because you have praised and the angelic hosts have, uh, your, your praise has ascended up to the heaven's altar and then something miraculous begins to happen in your life. <laughs> so, <laughs> Paul and Silas, they sang and then they got their miracles. We also see a man like Jonah. Jonah was, you know, God told him, go to Nineveh, minister to them, go and preach to them so that they will repent and come back to God because God loves every one of us. He does not want anybody to perish. So he sent Jonah. Jonah, in defiance to God's will, went in opposite direction. He said, I'm not going. And as he was running away from God, can we really run away from God? <laughs> Everything around him started to get trouble. The very ship he entered, the, everyone was in trouble. You know, that's how it is. When we are in disobedience, when we are running away from God, it is trouble, trouble, trouble. And it is not the best to run away from God. But then God still had a plan. When they did everything to stop, you know, the ship from capsizing, they said, what can we do? When, we, when they found out it was Jonah. And Jonah said, all you need to do to have your quietness and your peace is to throw me in the, you know, into the ocean and keep with your journey. They said, God, we don't want to do this, but there's nothing else we can do. We don't want to die with this young man. 
and they threw him in. For God had already prepared a ship. Um, not a ship, yeah? Ship fish. <laughs> a fish. <laughs> and so Jonah was, you know, swallowed by the fish. Imagine, I know I love fish, but I don't think I love the, the you know, the, <laughs> what do we call it? The belly of the fish. I don't think it's the best, you know, for you. I mean, think about it. If you, if you know how, if you clean your fish, you know what I'm talking about. That's where Jonah found himself. It was not a comfortable situation, but that's where he was. And <laughs> he stayed there. He remembered God. And that's what it is. When we are away, far away from God, maybe because of our own disobedience, we are not supposed to go down and go down and perish. If we can only remember God, just like the prodigal son, the Bible says he came to himself. He remembered God in the belly of the fish because it was not a comfortable place to stay. And then you know the statement he made in, in, in Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. He says, they that observe lying vanities forsake their mercies. I don't want to forsake my mercy. I know what I'm going to do. And so in verse 9, the Bible tells us he prayed. But he prayed, nothing happened. The next thing we hear about Jonah is that in that same verse, is that he turned from prayer into praise and said, I will sacrifice unto God with a voice of thanksgiving. I will give him praise. And when God heard that, really? You want to give me praise? Wow. The next verse, Jonah chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible said, God commanded the fish to bring Jonah out. So I don't know where we may be right now. If you can only but decide I'm going to praise God, in this situation, God is going to command that situation to give way so that you can have your freedom. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is nothing he cannot do. There is nothing impossible with him. And so Jonah <laughs> was freed. And then, of course, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Nobody told him to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to Nineveh. But that's another story. So... Where I really wanted to go today, yeah, I can do that, is Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles 20. This is uh, a, um, a group of people, and by the way, before I go there, there is one man that was called Hezekiah. In Isaiah 38, the Bible said that the prophet Isaiah, came to him and told him, organize your house because you're going to die. It's been decreed by the court of heaven, you're going to die. And it's a long story. But what I want to bring out there is, if you read that Isaiah 38, you begin to see where it says, can the dead praise you? Hezekiah was trying to recount, you know, reason with God because God said, let us reason together. One would have said, okay, this is a death sentence and it's from God and it's from the prophets of God, so my life is doomed. But he mentioned something which entered the ears of God. Can the dead praise you? It's only the living that can praise you as I do today. When God heard that, the man of God who has just prophesied and Whenever he prophesies, it happens. God told him, turn around. Go back. Tell him he's healed. He's not going to die again. I'm extending his years for 15 years. So it doesn't matter the decrees. It doesn't matter the death sentence. It doesn't matter what is coming against you. If you can only praise, that thing can be reversed. That thing can be restored. Hallelujah. So we are in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And it's a very long story. <laughs> but I'm going to just like pick it one after the other. In verse 1, news came to this king called Jehoshaphat. And he was told a vast army, multitudes of army from three big nations 
are coming against you, little Judah. When he heard it, like it is natural with any of us, the first thing that happened to him, the Bible says, he feared. Fear is natural. I mean, when you hear some bad news, when you hear something, maybe when a doctor gives you a report, you know, and then when the doctors, I don't know whether they delight in doing that, they give you such long name that you cannot even pronounce it. <laughs> and that name alone is already killing you before the sickness itself. Are you understanding? I don't know whether it happens to you. I went one time, they, you know, looked at me, and the doctor said, it must be this. And I said to him, say it again. He said it again. I tried to pronounce it. I said, not, not to bother. <laughs> because the name was so long. And it was just a small thing. Why can't you tell me, you know, that, you know, my... <laughs> Why can't you just tell me, doctor, that my potassium is, you know, not to the, uh, you know, the normal level? Why do you have to give me this long name that is already, you know, hearing the name is so big. I mean, my heart already feared. <laughs> so it's natural to have fear when you, you know, when things come against us. But there is something I love about this man. The Bible said he feared. But he turned his face to God. When you receive a bad news, when they give you those reports, who do you turn to? Where do you turn to? He turned to God. That's the first thing to do. That's the first thing. And when he turned to God, you know, so many things began to happen. He says, and then the next thing he did is that he set his face to seek the Lord in fasting and prayer. You know, when things come against us, let's begin to do what we know we can do. Because the ultimate belongs to him. He knows how to fight a battle. So he started to pray and he started to fast, which is a good thing. And yes, he, he called every other person that heard it to come join you know, that's why I was telling you, it's never good to be alone. Have people of like-mindedness who will agree with you in prayers. That's why most times when we finish here, we ask you to come. Because we want to agree with you in prayer concerning whatever issue that is a challenge to you. Because on your own, you may not be able to do it. The Bible says, one shall chase a thousand, but two shall chase ten thousands. And whatsoever two of us shall agree as touching on earth will be done of our Father in heaven. So, they all came together to pray. And when they started to pray, something happened. A prophet showed up, one that speaks for God, and began to, began to prophesy unto them. <laughs> Pastor Mike, do you have the scriptures at all? <laughs> okay. We are in Second Chronicles. <laughs> All right. Don't worry. <laughs> eh? Right there. Okay. Oh, that's from verse 1. That's verse 1. Okay. No, no, verse one. don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I'm, I have moved from verse 1 to around, around verse uh, 3 and now to 9, 5 to 9. So, um, the good thing there is that Jehoshaphat, can we get something like verse 5? Good. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple in the front of the new courtyard and said, this is why I want 6. The Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? Remember when we were <laughs> doing the last prayer? <laughs> we said, when you're praying to God, He's not just a father who is on the earth, who may be limited in resources, in finances, and, you know, power. We are dealing with a heavenly father who is not limited by anything. He has the cattle on a thousand hills. All power and might belong to him. And so he said, said to God, first of all, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. 
Let's go on, Pastor Mike. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before you, people, uh, your people Israel, and give it forever to the, the, your descendant of, uh, descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built it in it a sanctuary for your name. In other words, we have been worshiping you. This is a home for you. My life, my body is the temple of the Most High God. Anything that wants to destroy it, God is ready to destroy it first. So, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before the temple that bears your name and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. And then he began to say, now this is how these people are rewarding us. First of all, he appealed to God. He understood what God can do. And he was reminding God what he can do. That he acknowledges his almightiness. He acknowledges that nothing can withstand our God. He acknowledges he is in that place of implicit trust that God is able it doesn't matter the news. It doesn't matter how many. It doesn't matter the things that are coming against us. But what we know is that God is for us. Hallelujah. So please, verse 12. I love verse 12. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You know, it is not bad for you to acknowledge your own personal limitation. Are you understanding? But you remember that our, we, we, um, our lives, we are mighty through God. That is, we are not going to trust in our own power. In fact, by the time we realize that we don't have any power of our own, it will help us to focus on the almighty God who is there for us. And then he says, <laughs> Our eyes are on you. As the handmaiden looked to the mistress, so our eyes are on you. My eyes are not on any other thing. Some may trust in their chariots, others in their horses. I will remember the name of the Lord. My eyes are on you, O oh Lord. When, you know, that is what the enemy tries to do. He distracts us by taking our eyes from the Lord to put it on the circumstance. And the more you are putting your eyes on your circumstance and your challenge, it gets bigger and bigger. The enemy knows how to make it big. But when you take your eyes from your situation, your circumstance, and put it on God, you are magnifying God, and your situation is becoming smaller and smaller. Our eyes are on you. Yeah. Maybe 13, 14. Okay. I like this also. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. You know, there is, when we are talking about praise, maybe some other time I'll really have time to teach about praise and worship so that I can talk about the facets of praise. You know, when we lift up our hands, it's not just because we don't know where to keep it. It's because we are saying, Lord, we acknowledge you. You are the Lord of my life. That's why I lift up my hands. I surrender everything I'm passing through. Even the standing that we stand in the presence of God is a, a, a position of worship unto God. Even when we wave our hands to the Lord, we are saying, Lord, you are the Lord of the whole universe. So, you know, I don't, <laughs> I'm not going into that. Oh, no. Hallelujah. So, uh, they stood in the presence of God to hear him speak. And so what happened then? The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of, oh, all of them, as he stood in the assembly, the next one. <laughs> he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid. Ooh! Or discouraged because of the vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. The Lord delights to exchange that battle. You have struggled enough. You have battled enough. You have, you know, come in defeat enough. The Lord wants to exchange it. Can you hand it over to him? 
He said, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. He knows what we are passing through. He knows us through and through. He knows the sleepless nights. He knows the cries. He knows that thing which even your friend or your mother does not know. Because he's a loving God. And so he said, don't be discouraged. He now gave a, an order. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of this, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. Just go ahead. Go forward. Don't allow any fear to come against you. Go forward. You will not have to fight in this battle. I love that. Isn't it good for you to not to fight? I love not to fight. I used to have an elder brother. One elder brother. The other one's uh, below me. I, when I'm in trouble, I call him to come fight for me. <laughs> I just stay behind him and say, <laughs> And then he's there fighting for me. <laughs> he gets the bruises. He gets the, you know, the everything. But I'm just there relaxing because somebody is fighting for me. I love it when God fights for me too. <laughs> he says, take up your place. Stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord will, that will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord be with you. That thing that has been making you to, you know, draw back. It's a time for you to arise and face it. Because you're not facing it in your own strength. You're facing it with the strength which God's might has provided for you. So do we have the next verse? Oh, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground. And the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship. Remember, the army was still there. The enemy was they were still there. Nothing has happened yet. But what has happened is that they have heard the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord which they have heard, they have trusted it that if God said it, he will bring it to pass. And so what did they do? They bowed down and they worshipped. When you hear the word of God concerning your situation, what do you do? Begin to praise him, begin to bow down, begin to worship him. Because as you do that, he will say, yes, you are king into my word. I'm going to come to make it perfect. Then some of the Levites from the Christ and others stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a loud voice. Don't praise him, you know, as sorrowful. Praise him with a loud voice. You know, sometimes we are so quiet about it. We are so pious about it. Look, there is something that is called loud praise. High praise. Do you know what brought down the walls of Jericho was nothing but praise? Because that shout, what a shout of victory it says in, in Hebrew, is called ruah. It's a form of praise. Where you shout and that same shout pierces, you know, beyond this where we are and goes straight to heaven. And God begins to do mighty things. That's what brought the walls of Jericho down. And so they've praised God with a loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa and set out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me. Oh, oh, oh. Let's go to the next verse. <laughs> After consulting uh, the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army saying, look at what they said. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. They were just appealing to his attributes. They did not even say, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. He just, they just told God, this is who you are. You are good and your mercy is endure forever. That's all I need to say to you, Lord. That's all I need to say. Thank you, Lord. You are good. Your mercy is endure forever. You have seen me through before. You can see me through again. And as they did that, hey, look at as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushment. Who set ambushment? The Lord. Set ambushment against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah. And they were what? Defeated. Let's see the next verse. <laughs> see how God fought. See how he did it. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up. They said, these were people who came together to fight Judah. Now, because the Lord has led ambushment and brought confusion into their midst, the Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped <laughs> to destroy one another. The next verse. Oh, when the men of Judah... So, <laughs> remember the men of Judah were still marching and coming up. 
They have not reached the battleground. But guess what has happened? Because they are already praising the holiness of God, God has gone ahead of them into the battle, caused confusion. The three nations that came against them began to kill each other. And they were all defeated. But the next verse is so interesting. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw what? What did they see? Only dead bodies. Uh, lying on the ground, no one had escaped. When the Lord fights for you, nothing escapes him. They looked. They have not even reached there. They looked and they saw only dead bodies. What can dead bodies do? <laughs> nothing. And the next verses say that, God, uh, you know, the people now took so many days in plundering or you know, taking what the dead bodies <laughs> had gold, silver, clothing, everything because God has made it abundance to them. The Lord fought for his people. And there is a verse I love there that said, All the people around them, um, see, verse 9, where are we? Okay, there was so much plunder that it took three days to collect. Next verse, please. Because that's where I'm heading. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Berica, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the valley of Berica to this day. Next verse, please. Then led, by, uh, then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. Please, next verse. Wait, I'm looking for the verse that talks about everyone around. Maybe the next one still. Everyone that heard of what the Lord has done for them. Is it that one now? Yes. The fear of God came on, the, on all the surrounding kingdoms where they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. When you praise God, when you are a praiser of God, your neighbors will you know, just be watching and seeing what God is doing. The, your co-workers will wonder, what is the secret in your life? Everybody around you, no matter where you are, because it's like what is affecting us is not affecting you. Because every day you come out beaming with smile and worshiping and praising. They don't understand how it is. Because, in, you know, it's like the other way around. I mean, when things are difficult for you, you're supposed to be crying or, you know, frowning or something. But... People are seeing you passing through things and you're still smiling through it and you're still telling yourself God is good. You're still singing your praise. Your praise is not diminished. Every day you're still singing. Your praise will ever be in my mouth. That's what we sang today. And when that is a, a, a regular occurrence in your life and not just what you do when you come to services like this, but in your home, on the road, wherever you are, you will discover you will live a life of victory. I want to encourage us today. I don't know what you have heard. If you make praise a lifestyle, you will be on the victorious side. Because God will always come to your rescue. It doesn't matter what the enemies are. It doesn't matter what the challenges are. All you need to do is to take that position of praise and say, no matter what, Lord, yeah, I know it's not easy, but I'm going to offer it. I want to tell you the truth. Sometimes it's not easy for you to just start praising. And what, I mean, it's natural when something good happens to you, for you to dance, for you to, I do that, roll on the ground, raise your hand, dance. But when it is the other way around, that's why it's a sacrifice. And that is the praise that God inhabits. The one that is a sacrifice. Because he now says, if this is my daughter, if this is my son, can still praise me in the midst of this. I am going to rise on her account. So I want to encourage you, no matter what you're passing through, it doesn't matter what it is, dare to begin to praise God. You will see something tremendous. I don't have time to give you personal testimonies of great things the Lord has done for me just by praising him. In fact, when I come to that point of, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what prayer to pray. Because sometimes you come to a position, you don't even know what to pray again. Or your prayers may be so limited. You don't even know the fullness of what God has for you. Here it says that 
Nothing escaped. You may be praying for a pencil. Oh, I don't know what. A pencil. But there is something God has for you, not just a pencil. He wants, you, he wants to give you a paper also. He wants to give you other things. In your praise, God does it totally. Not just what you're asking for, but those things you're not asking for, but he knows that you need them. He will supply it in your accounts. So I don't know where you are today. I just want to tell you, the Lord loves you. He is worthy of our praise. He created you for praise. There is no other reason we are living but to worship God. I want to encourage you, no matter what you're passing through, dare to praise him. He's going to show up on your account. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? At this moment, we are going to leave the altar open. The pastors are going to come around. If there is anything you want us to agree with you, even if it is salvation, it is flowing freely, the Lord's presence is here today to meet you at the point of your need. You can come forward. They will agree with you in prayers and you will see God at work in your life. Hallelujah.